Hello, I'm Craig Johnson. Welcome to Literary Lockdown. Well, the third time's the charm. We are revisiting restoration diarist Samuel Pepys. When Upstart Theater did the full show in the 1990s, we uh, didn't really have a set, but a shout out to Luther Salveson, who built us this nice screen, and Brian Columbus, who painted it. The other side is just wood, so we were able to use that for most of our sets for Upstart Theater. Well, Pepys wrote his diary of the 1660s using a little-known shorthand, but when he had to describe something more intimate, he also wrote in Latin in shorthand. So for any number of reasons, it took a couple hundred years until all of the diaries were published, but these entries were some of the first because of Pepys' detailed eyewitness account. You see, less than a year after the plague had swept through London, this happened. 1666, September 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th. Some of our maids sitting up late last night to get things ready against our feast today. Jane called us up about three in the morning to tell us of a great fire they saw in the city. So I rose and slipped on my nightgown and went to her window and thought it to be at the backside of Mark Lane at the farthest, and so went to bed again and to sleep. About seven, rose again to dress myself, and by and by Jane comes and tells me that she hears that above 300 houses have been burned down tonight by the fire we saw, and that it is now burning down all Fish Street by London Bridge. So I made myself ready presently, and walked to the tower, and there got up upon one of the high places, Sir John Robinson's little son going up with me. And there I did see the houses at that end of the bridge all on fire, and an infinite great fire on this and the other side of the bridge. The lieutenant of the tower tells me that it begun this morning in the King's Baker's house in Pudding Lane, and that it hath burned St. Magnus Church and most part of Fish Street already. So I, down to the waterside, and there got a boat and saw a lamentable fire, everybody endeavoring to remove their goods and flinging into the water, poor people staying in their houses as long as till the very fire touched them, and then running into boats or clamoring from one pair of stairs by the waterside to another. And among other things, the poor pigeons, I perceive, were loath to leave their houses, but hovered about the windows and balconies till they were, some of them, their wings burned and fell down. Having stayed, and in an hour's time seen the fire rage every way, and nobody to my sight endeavoring to quench it, but to remove their goods and leave all to the fire, and the wind mighty high and driving it into the city, and everything after so long a drought proving combustible, I to Whitehall, where people did come about me, and I did give them an account, dismayed them all, and word was carried in to the king. So I was called for, and I did tell the king and the Duke of York what I saw, and that unless his majesty did command houses to be pulled down, Nothing could stop the fire. The king commanded me to go to my lord mayor from him and command him to spare no houses but to pull down before the fire every way. I walked along Watling Street as well as I could, and here and there sick people carried away in beds. At last met my lord mayor in Canning Street, like a man spent with a, a, a handkerchief about his neck. To the king's message he cried, like a fainting woman, Oh lord, what can I do? I am spent. People will not obey me. I have been pulling down the houses, but the fire overtakes us faster than we can do it. People all almost distracted, and no manner of means used to quench the fire. The houses, too so very thick thereabouts and full of matter of burning as pitch and tar and warehouses of oil and wines and brandy and other things. Met with the king and the Duke of York in their barge, river full of boats taking in goods and good goods swimming in the water, so near the fire as we could for smoke and all over the Thames with one space in the wind, you were almost burned with a shower of fire drops. This is very true. So as houses were burned by these drops and flakes of fire, three or, or four, no, no, nay, nay, five or six houses, one from another, when we could endure no more upon the water, we to a little ale house on the bank side over against the three cranes, and there stayed 
till it was dark almost, and saw the fire grow. And as it grew darker, appeared more and more, and in corners, and upon steeples, and between churches and houses, as far as we could see up the hill of the city, in the most horrid, malicious, bloody flame, we saw the fire as only one entire arch of fire from this to the other side of the bridge, and in a bow up the hill for an arch above a mile long. It made me weep to see it, and a horrid noise the flames made, and the cracking of houses from their ruin. So home, with a sad heart, and they'll find everybody discoursing and lamenting the fire, but news coming every moment of the growth of a fire. So we were forced to begin to pack up our own goods and prepare for their removal. About four o'clock in the morning, my Lady Batten sent me a cart to carry away all my money and plate and best things to Sir William Riders, which I did, riding myself in my nightgown in the cart. And Lord, to see how the streets and the highways are crowded with people running and riding and getting of carts at any rate to fetch away things. At night, lay down a little upon a quilt of Will Hewers in the office, all my own things being packed up for gone. Up by break of day to get away the remainder of my things. Sir William Batten, not knowing how to remove his wine, did dig a pit in the garden and laid it in there. And in the evening, Sir William Penn and I did dig another and put our wine in it. And I, my Parmesan cheese, now begins the practice of blowing up houses in Tower Street which at first it frightened people more than anything. But it stopped the fire where it was done, it bringing down the houses to the ground in the same places they stood. And then it was easy to quench what little fire was in it. I wrote to my father this night, but the post house being burned, the letter could not go up and met with Mr. Young and Whistler and received good hopes that the fire at our end is stopped. They and I walked into town and find Fenchurch Street, Gracious Street and Lombard Street all in dust. The exchange a sad sight, nothing standing there of all the statues and pillars but Sir Thomas Gresham's picture in the corner. Walked into Moorfields, our feet ready to burn, walking through the town among the hot coals, and find that full of people and poor wretches carrying their goods there and everybody keeping his goods together by themselves. I also did see a poor cat taken out of a hole in the chimney joining to the wall of the exchange with all the hair burned off the body and yet alive. September 17th. Up the times and shaved myself after a week's growth. But Lord, how ugly I was yesterday and how fine today. By water, seeing the city all the way. A sad sight indeed. Home to bed, and find to my infinite joy many rooms clean, and myself and wife to lie in our own chamber again. But much terrified in the night's nowadays, with dreams of fire and falling down of houses.